alluded to last night when you were playing that you had to keep, um, as you said, you had to put a new dress on somebody else's tune. Starting to be. <laughs> yes, I'm speaking to you. So I sent you a note. You not only, you know, you took her out of the habit and you put her into a strapless gown. And how do you keep fresh somebody else's music that you're performing in a in a concert? Because everybody knows this, everybody knows every single line and every single note. So how do you, how, if this can be for anybody, how do you keep the music fresh? Did you all hear that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Go. That's uh, the same way uh, that we look at, uh, if, I would, if I would say the same exact thing that you asked me, it would sound different than the way you asked me. But our creativity as artists and our knowledge and our homework of listening to the various uh, artists playing the same song maybe, or having our own take of what our strong points are, and we apply that to that tune, automatically changes it and transforms it into what your take is on it. In that particular arrangement, um, Tamir Hindelman brought in, uh, he'd played in a Brazilian band for about a year, so he had all the Brazilian rhythms down, and, and I knew the beat that he was talking about, so he wanted to put this beat on it, and then he thought, well, okay, I'll double the bass line with Christoph, and that's kind of one of the sounds that we have in the trio, so it, it automatically worked with what we did, but we didn't have anything with that beat, so it made it something even fresher for us. And, um, and before you know it, it does, it's got to be press on it, and you didn't really work that hard to do it. It's just your, your creativity just starts, and it's like picking out what you're going to wear that day. You know, oh, that's not quite the, the shade of red I want with this, so you, you, know, you, you alter your, your editing the whole time. So that's, that's kind of the same thing we're doing. But you have to rely on your own confidence as an artist to know that it's going to be interesting for you and the audience, and not just some moo moo that's going to hang there on stage. You know, instead of a dress. <laughs> Where to come up with that? <laughs> wow. We've also done a little number on uh, Hookie Lao that we'll be playing this afternoon. <laughs> Dresses. I'll take it from the chick singer perspective. <laughs> For me, when I do mine, it's all about uh, the relationship with the lyric. And as comedians, we'll take normal things that we do in everyday life and shed a little different light on it to make us look at things differently. Uh, one of the things that I love to do is take standards and really look at the lyric perhaps from a different angle. And from those things, it tells me, like, well, how do I want to express that musically? Is it a groove? Is it harmonizations that I want to change? Is it a little bit of both? Um, and then using, you know, the things that the rest of the guys bring to the, to the music that helps shape those things. But for me, it's more from a lyric perspective on how to really treat the lyric like a gem that it is and to let the music um, go around with that. So that's what it is. Well, you know, for me, I think, you know, every day, we, it's, it's so based off emotion, and it's where you are in your life at that particular moment, it makes everything so unique. So that would be one perspective on me, but um, a tour that I was on, I was I got to go to Japan with McCoy Tyner, and we were there for, I don't know, four weeks. And so every single night, we played the same exact set, every night, never changed. Same set, he'd say the same thing on the mic. Yeah, everybody, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's the exact same way. And I, was, I mean, you know, after about I don't know three weeks, and we had three more weeks to go, I said to him one day at lunch, I said, um, McCoy, why is it that we play the same exact set every night? And he said, We're gonna play it until we get it right. <laughs> Another question? There's a hand in the back. Yeah. Um, we were talking about the students and uh, the fine players that are coming along, but how about the audience? Yeah. Uh, all present accepted, we're kind of a graying audience, and it seems to be that way. Do you find there is an interest in the music generally from a younger audience? Did everybody hear that one? Yeah. Okay. 
Yes, there is an interest in, in this really? music from a younger audience. I just got an email 20 minutes before I came over here from a 21-year-old piano player student in L.A. who's trying any way they can to get on the jazz cruise so that they could rub elbows with the 10 piano players that there are on the, on the jazz cruise. Um, the reason you don't see 20-year-olds at this weekend is because they can't afford it. You folks are fortunate enough to be able to afford the price for the weekend, and a lot of the jazz parties are like that. The jazz cruises are like that because they're too expensive for a college student who's paying $45,000 a year to go to college. So, uh, yes, you, you just don't see them, but they are, I mean, there are clubs that where only 20-year-olds hang out. And in Los Angeles, there are three that I found out last week. I didn't even know the clubs existed. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're creating their own scene. In New York, there are a lot of young clubs, you know, where Joe Clayton told me where it's only people that age go there. So, uh, it's, it's around and there's definitely an interest. And my goodness, if you, if you want to play this music and you can't find the information online or anywhere else, shame on you. Because we were dropping a needle on an LP to try to transcribe solos and dropping it in the same place on, on an LP. Now you've got the internet, you've got DVDs, and the whole world of information for them is right before them. So it's, it, it's up to them whether they want it or not. And on the computer, you can now slow it down as you transcribe, so you don't have to do it with the needle drop, like in the dark ages. <laughs> you know, it's, that's, that's a really interesting question, and I would direct you to go to two places that are really inspiring. One would be the Lionel Hampton Jazz Festival, because at that festival, I mean, there's so many hungry students that make up the whole audience. And they're, they're going to be our audience for tomorrow. And then the other festival would be the Port Townsend. It's the same situation. And then there you know that jazz is in good hands because the audience, you know, or people, they can afford to be there. And they're there with so much love and enthusiasm. I, I do have to add that we as graying listeners have to accept the younger the players coming in, musicians coming in to listen to the performance. At the Newport Beach Jazz Party in California, I had four students coming in, and one had uh, Rastafarian hair, but he's from Dallas, Texas, you know, so it looked kind of funny. And he's 6'4", and he walked in, and the table in front of him turned around and said, what the hell are you doing here listening to our music? You know, and he left. So I'm not putting up with that. So we've got to, if we really are serious about embracing young people to get into this music, don't put them off by claiming it as your own music. You know, it's like every, every time I talk to somebody about big bands, they say, I like those, but I don't like jazz. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you think all this got started? You know, so uh, make sure that we're a community, a jazz community that invites everyone into this and not, not to claim it as, Oscar Peterson's my group. You like Dave Brubeck, I can't stand that, but I like Oscar Peterson. And we're all in this together, so let's embrace the music as a jazz community. Question is, in the Los Angeles area, are you able to touch the inner city kids with the music? Yes, but sometimes they're not able to touch us because I've gone to Washington Prep before and was ignored by the students who didn't want to accept me as an educator. They didn't know who I was. They were listening to hip hop and various kinds of music and they had no idea who I was. And I offered to the two drummers to give them drum lessons and I never heard from them again. So it's, it's not just that they're sitting there waiting for us to come in and feed them. You know, they have to want it too. And that's the dilemma I have when I go to, to schools like that. And then they're not willing to listen, listen to an old 58-year-old guy tell them that they might want to try this instead of this. So you know, a lot of, all I can do is offer it. But then they have to receive it and show that they really want the information. There's also a program in Los Angeles uh, during the month of February for Black History Month. It's jazz in the schools, and uh, I've been a part for the last seven years, I guess, or so, of a group that um, went out uh, every Monday through Friday for the entire month of February uh, playing concerts in elementary schools to get the kids interested. And it's in every district of Los Angeles, so you get 
you know, some nicer neighborhoods, but you also get you know, the ones where they have to let you in at the gate, and you have the, the guards lead you to the little cafetorium place. Um, so it's, you know, the challenge is, is the funding for that program, which has been cut back because of the Musicians Trust Fund. Uh, the LA Jazz Society was contributing to some of that, um, you know, through, I think, it was the Herb Albert or something. Oh, yeah. Foundation. So there's various sources, so the schools don't have to pay anything. So it's not only restricted to schools that can afford it. So if there are programs like that, I think, across the country, whether it's for Jazz History Month, what is April? Something? I don't know. It's, Every it's month. May. It's well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some programs that exist that put um, programs in the schools, because if the kids don't hear it, how are they going to, you know, but if, if the jazz group comes through one day a year, that's, you know, but yet the school doesn't have a music program, it's really hard to sustain that unless there is music in the schools. And it's really easy to tell, especially in those poor neighborhoods, that the kids are really innately excited about music in general. They just, they see live instruments, they see people playing and then talking to them about music. They love it. But if the school doesn't have music as a way of their school culture, there's so much emotion involved for them, they don't know how to handle it. So there's discipline issues in that. There, you know, the schools that do have music programs, even with large numbers of students, they can deal with it. They're calmer, they participate more, they're much more active where with some of the schools, they just, it's so overwhelming for them. So if there's some way we could even get more of those things happening, I think that would be good. One thing we can do too, as, uh, as older people that, that might have the means to sponsor a program to go into the schools, uh, you know, Mike and I in San Diego play Gilbert Castellanos, uh, Bob Magnuson. We play in the schools, and the key to, to that in San Diego was going into the elementary and early middle schools. Because that's when they're not inhibited from sitting there going like this while we're playing, you know, and they're totally into it. They get up and dance. They're, that's the age. Because by late middle school and high school, they're sitting here like this. Yeah, show me something, white girl. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 uh, the inner city schools in in San Diego have very high African American and Latino uh, students, a very high percentage, and they're listening to I don't even know what it is. It's not even really hip hop. It's some kind of Latin, maybe like a Latin hip hop kind of thing. And yet, we played Watermelon Man, and everybody was just like, oh, yeah. You know, so that, it's the age that you get them. I, don't, I think maybe high school's too late in, in a lot of cases. Uh, how are we doing? Okay, we're good. Yeah. She's asking how we, coming from four different locations, come here and, and rehearse and put things together, and how do we, how does, how do we get the drums? Jeff travels with his drums because of his drum company, um, and how does that work? So that's a housekeeping question. She said. Sure. Um, you know, I think you know jazz is a language, so. We all have this common language that we all know, and we can come together. And, and when we do call a composition, um, everyone knows it. They may know it a little bit differently, and that's the joy of the music. Because as soon as we start to play it, everyone's ears are up, and everyone's listening to how these chord changes are, or what this rhythm is, or how the melody is played here. And so it's it's a it's a great opportunity to come together and share a language. And this language we can share no matter where we go. Um, so, so that's what we did. For example, last night we came and we said, what song do you want to do? And they said, Tarot, you pick it. And I said, well, 
I'll close my eyes. And we did it in the key of F. And do you want an intro? And they said, no, let's just come right in on it. And so we didn't talk about how we'd end it, but you know, to end the song, you know, we played a pretty traditional or typical, whatever you want to call it, vamp at the end. And then there's different signals you can play as far as uh, melodic signals you can play. The rhythm section, you know, you're going to end the song. And everyone knows that. And so you end the song and you move on to the next adventure. So uh, that's pretty much how we did it last night. And as you, last, I think a couple years ago, I did come here with a rehearsed group. And, and for that instance, we did rehearse a couple of times before we did our performance. And with the Clayton Brothers, we rehearse pretty frequently. And the, my trio is obviously rehearsed, and, and we spend a lot of time on those arrangements. You don't just get up and put all that together, but we really be good. Um, <laughs> and then in Monty Alexander's set, I played with him, as I said earlier, in 1975, and so I, I remember a lot of the materials and, and the hits and the stops and the baps and wherever, and so you, you retain that. But the fun of it is, is seeing if you are going to remember it. And then he played, he played one tune that, uh, where we had kind of that hip-hop beat. Now, I don't, I'm not a hip-hop drummer, obviously.